Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 60, believe it or not, of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlight, so we take a look at some of the wonderful animals that we share our world with, but wow, we've already got up to 60 after like a year or so, 60 parts, and I've still got at least 7 more parts to go before the next uh, DLC, so that'll be the next few weeks, so we've got a lot more Planet Zoo coming up, and I know you guys love that. So today we've got a lot, still got quite a bit of fish, uh, they've been really pumping out a lot of fish. Uh, we're going to be starting today with the common roach done by Leaf and Buffsu. And pretty much all the fish are going to be involved with Le uh, Leaf, Buffsu and the silver arrow one is coming, it's going to be done by a little bit of Jen as well. So this is the common roach. So these guys also known as the, um, just the roach or the rutilus roach. Uh, these guys are refreshed and brackish water fish that uh, is native to most of Europe and Western Asia. And these guys are a small fish, they're not too big. They typically get no more than a foot long, about 35 centimeters or 14 inches. Though their maximum length can approach about 50 centimeters or 20 inches. So they typically have this like bluish silvery color and then these wet becomes lighter along its belly as you can kind of see here. And then also it's almost got these reddish colors to its fins. And um, there's believed to be kind of, um, I believe two subspecies or no, 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 that's a different animal. But um, these guys, as I mentioned, they're commonly found throughout Europe except around the Mediterranean. They don't really like those. And they are found eastward into Siberia, Eastern Europe and Asia where there are several subspecies that live uh, with an ocean-going life cycle within the Caspian and Black Seas. And across the Mediterranean and northern parts of Spain and Portugal, there's several closely related species that are related to these guys. There seems to be no uh, overlap with their distribution. Um, they've also been introduced into Australia, into the Murray River, and coastal drainages of southern New South Wales and Victoria during the 1860s and 1880s because of fishing, because people want to fish for them. And uh, unfortunately for uh, <laughs> us, they're very, very adaptable and can be found in pretty much any freshwater ecosystem, uh, which is pretty bad for obviously when they're introduced into places where they shouldn't be. They usually live ranging in areas ranging from small ponds to uh, large rivers and lakes. They feed on every depth, though they, the food that they prefer to eat is typically found in shallower water. And they're actually one of the most tolerant uh, fish of organic pollution, and are one of the last species of fish to disappear in polluted water. And uh, they typically live in temperatures from close to freezing, about 4 degrees or 39 degrees Fahrenheit, to up to about 31 degrees or 88 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's their typical. In most parts of their range, they're also quite numerous, and um, they can be surpassed by the common bream and biomass with waters with sparse vegetation and high turbidity. And they're a shoaling fish and not very migratory, uh, with the exception of the ongoing uh, ocean-going subspecies. And as I mentioned, they usually inhabit fresh water that's uh, somewhat vegetated because these larva and young fish are protected by the vegetation and the mature fish use them as food. And they feed on a wide range of foods from plant material, bottom-dwelling invertebrates, uh, worms and maggots as well. Young feed mainly on plankton until they're big enough to eat this wider diet. And they're pretty adaptable. They can adapt to environments where invertebrates are, scare are scarce by slowing their body growth and even maturing early sometimes. And they may live up to 15 years in captivity. So in terms of, I mean, 15 years or more. So they're quite long lived, uh, probably live in longer captivity. In terms of reproduction, they typically uh, they spawn from May to June. There's some variations being triggered by different uh, water temperatures during spring and summer, and also varies across their wide range. And they generally spawn in the same location every year, and large males form schools with the females will enter these schools. The males will uh, trail the females and fertilize their eggs, and they're quite rough, and the fish will often jump out of the water to try and get the obviously show out the best. And the female can lay up to 100,000 eggs, and when the pH of water is below 5.5, they cannot reproduce. So they are pretty sensitive to things like pH and things, but they seem to be doing pretty well. They can pretty much found almost everywhere, so they can easily find the perfect conditions by the looks of it. And pretty beautiful fish, if I do say so myself. So yeah, really wonderful. We started off with the common loach uh, by Leaf and Buffsu. Now the next one is also done by Leaf and Buffsu. We have got the Eurasian carp, so this is another even worse invasive species that we'll talk about. So look at these wonderful guys here, so this is the Eurasian carp. So these guys also known as the common carp, 
are uh, freshwater fish that are pretty much found natively across lakes and large rivers around Europe and Asia. The wild population is considered vulnerable by the IUCN, but they have been uh, domesticated and introduced into environments worldwide, which has often considered them on the list of one of the top 100 most invasive species. So it's a good uh, comparison between like um, they could be vulnerable in the wild, even endangered in their natural range, but they could be invasive in other places. So it's kind of like that. As I mentioned, they are native to Europe and Asia. They're pretty much found all across uh, kind of like the inland areas of Europe and Asia. And they've been introduced to pretty much everywhere except the poles. So you find them in Australia, South Africa, America, New Zealand, pretty much everywhere. And in terms of their physiology, they have this quite robust build, as you can see here, with these dark uh, gold sheen patterns, which is most prominent on the head, and these large scales. The average growth rate is about half that of domestic carp, and they do not reach the same lengths and weights of domestic carp, but they can get to a maximum length of, uh, the largest recorded carp was about 45.59 kilograms, or 100 pounds, and the average size for a common carp in terms of its length is about, uh, and weight is about 40 to 80 centimeters, or 15 uh, to 31 inches, or, and 2 to 14 kilos of 4.5 to 31 pounds. So there's quite a bit of variation there, but they don't nearly get as big as their domestic counterparts. So in terms of the habitats, they're typically found in conditions like large bodies of slow moving or stand, uh, standing water with soft sediments. And they prefer to live in groups of about five or more since they are a schooling fish. And they also mainly live in temperate climates and fresh or slightly brackish waters. Uh, and the temperatures generally between 3 and 35 degrees, or 37 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The ideal temperature for these guys is about uh, 23 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or 73 to 86 uh, Fahrenheit. It was 23 to 30 Celsius and 73 to 86 Fahrenheit, with a spawning between 17 to 18 degrees, or 63 to 64 Fahrenheit. Uh, and they can easily survive in frozen uh, over ponds, and they can spend some time in like those frozen ponds and do all right. And in terms of their diet, they are omnivorous, so they pretty much feed on whatever they can get their mouths around. They can be fed on um, herbivorous diets, such as aquatic plants, also scavenge the bottom of rivers for invertebrates, uh, crustaceans, including zooplankton, craw uh, crawfish, and bethnic worms as well. And in terms of reproduction, they can lay up to 30,000 eggs in a single spawn, so that's one female. And although they spawn in the spring in response to the rising water temperatures, and rainfall, they can spawn multiple times in a season. And in commercial operations, they often simulate that. It's called high poly physis, uh, where they kind of uh, eject uh, pituitary extract into the fish to try and get it to breed as much as possible because they're obviously farming them. And they put the hormones in to stimulate the gonads or the sexual organs to ultimately produce more babies. So that's kind of turning them on 11 so they produce lots and lots of babies. And a single carp can actually live, uh, lay over a million eggs in a year, and they often fall victim to bacteria and predators and all that. And juveniles can be preyed on by animals such as northern pike and bass, and a number of birds such as cormorants and ospreys. Also, mammals that can eat them include otter and mink. And as we've been talking about, they are quite common in aquaculture, as including the domestic varieties, uh, koi are a type of carp. Um, also, the really often farm for aquaculture as well and they've been introduced uh, either accidentally or purposely in a lot of areas across the world australia south africa america south america a lot of places and they are eaten as well so they are considered one of the most invasive species because they're just so voracious and they pretty much will destroy and outcompete any other fish in their environment they take a similar niche they breed so fast they can overwhelm ecosystems with no controls and a lot of people are not very uh, happy that they're uh, destroying native species and, and they're very bad as I mentioned they're the one of the top 100 most invasive species in the world but they're still pretty cool regardless and a wonderful model and yeah really proud of that also done by Leith and Buxley we're gonna be moving on to the Nile perch as well another kind of invasive species uh, let's have a looky loo and uh, look at these wonderful big fishies so this is the Nile perch so these guys, also known as the African uh, Snook, the Goliath Perch, the Goliath Barramundi, or the Victoria Perch, these guys are a very large uh, freshwater fish that are widespread through Africa. So they're 
native to the Congo, uh, the Nile, Seng uh, Sengal, Niger, and Lake Chad, and Lake uh, Valita, and Tunkana. And they typically also occur in the brackish waters in Lake Marut in uh, Egypt. And the rock so also kind of a fish that is a sustainable economic and food security fish within East Africa. And they typically, as you can see, get this quite silverish color with this blue tinge and they have these black eyes along with these bright yellow rings around them. So it really gives them a distinct look, I think. And also with these uh, orangish finge, fins. And they're quite large. They're one of the largest freshwater fishes you can get. They reach a maximum length of about 2 meters or 6 feet 7 inches. And they weigh up to 200 kilograms or 440 pounds. Though mature fish on average weigh are about 1.21 to 1.37 or 4 foot to 4 foot 6 on average. Though many fish are caught before they can get this large. It's just because they're so caught so... It's really only the big ones that are lucky ones that avoid. And they pretty much uh, live in any lake or water habitat that has freshwater habitat that has sufficient oxygen uh, and while the juveniles are, restrict are restricted to shallow and freshwater and near shore environments uh, a fierce predator they pretty much feed on whatever they can they will feed on fish that include its own species the cannibals crustaceans insects and the juveniles will feed on zooplankton and these guys also uh, use schooling as a mechanism to defend themselves from other predators which can include things like crocodiles and things and they are technically an invasive species. They have been introduced to uh, the state of Queensland, um, and it's kind of illegal there. They've often been introduced to places like that since they're quite a common fish for anglers. A lot of people want to think, oh, I want to get this big fish. And they've been introduced to Lake Victoria because of that uh, in East Africa. And um, in terms of threats, though, they're very successful in their invasive, as an invasive species. They face their own threats because of the species being a large fish or a megafaunal animal. They're often very, very uh, susceptible to overfishing and the use of illegal fishing gear as well as the invasive water hyacinths. And they're also vulnerable to uh, prey depletion as well because they take prey away from them getting as large, which makes them more vulnerable to predators such as crocodiles. But yeah, they seem to be doing pretty okay at the moment. They're considered the least concerned. And a pretty cool fish, if I do say so myself. I'm a big fan of the Nile perch. So now we're going to move on from the perch. We're going to be looking at the rainbow trout. So here's another very famous trophy fish. Let's see if you can find these guys here. So look at you. How wonderful. I'm in a good time. Let's see if you can get one swimming. Let's have a look at this one. So this is the rainbow trout. There's a lot known about rainbow trouts. So these guys are a trout or a species of salmonoid, which are native to cold water tributaries of the Pacific Ocean and in Asia and North America. And they have been introduced into the Great Lakes and they will spawn uh, with steelheads. They've also been introduced to places like uh, Southern Europe, Australia, New Zealand and South America where they have damaged native fish, especially in New Zealand. There's a lot of native fish that have been uh, really hurt by these guys. Um, and these guys, as adults, they will reach an average about 0 0.5 to 2.5 kilograms of 1 to 5 pounds. While the lake dwelling in anadromous forms may reach up to 9 kilograms. And there's a lot of variation within the subspecies, so there will be lots of different uh, colors, different variations in color. Though adult fish typically have this broad reddish stripe down their lateral line, as you can see here, uh, from the gills of the tails, and it's most visible in breeding males. So, um, so local, some local populations are threatened uh, and stuff like that, but they're luckily considered secure in most of their range. And there's also been lots of issues because they hybridize with other fish or closely related species or subspecies that affects their purity. Also, uh, just being so uh, introduced widely and invasive, they've been considered also one of the top 100 invasive species in the world. But the reason they've obviously been introduced to these places is because of fisheries, so people want to fish for them. They're a very common fish for people to try and fish. And yeah, they generally, in terms of spawning, they typically will spawn between early to late spring, which is January to June in the Northern Hemisphere, or September to November in the Southern Hemisphere. And where temperatures reach at least 6 to 7 uh, degrees Celsius, or 42 to 44 Fahrenheit. And their maximum recorded lifespan is about 11 years. So yeah, the, there's some variation because some can uh, some migrate out into the water to breed, some don't. Uh, in terms of feeding, they're not uh, as as aggressive as like brown trout. 
but they will eat uh, typically on things like uh, larvae or pupae of aquatic insects, uh, fish, uh, crayfish, other crustaceans. Some lake dwelling forms are also platonic, so they'll feed on plankton and things. And adults of steelheads will feed on like fish, squids, and arthropods. So there's a lot of variation. It depends where they are. I know in New Zealand they've actually been known to eat wetter, so that's also very interesting. Um, the native ranges I mentioned is kind of the coastal water and tributary systems from the Pacific Basin. So they're found from the Kamachaka Peninsula in Russia down to the southwest of Alaska and along the British coast. And they can be found, I believe, pretty much down into California. But there is wild populations pretty much everywhere because of people wanting to breed them. For both agriculture because they're farmed and they're obviously good eating, but also they're a very common game fish. Uh, another big issue for them in terms of uh, in the wild is kind of a whirling disease, which is a parasite that they can get, which can affect wild fish populations. Also hybridization with different subspecies and species has been some issues. Um, also removal methods of been trying to get rid of them such as uh, they've been done by either poisoning rivers or trying to get people to fish them as much as possible just to get them out of get out of the water but yeah in terms of fish they're very very rec uh, people love to fish them for recreation and that's the main reason they've been introduced all over the world along for obviously being a food fish and they do taste pretty good and they are really cool animals it's just they shouldn't be where they shouldn't be uh, like in where they haven't evolved, but yeah, some really wonderful fish uh, So that was also done by leaf and buff suit and the next one is not a fish that's famous for eating But it's very famous for being like a very common uh, aquarium fish so These guys is but done by leaf buff suit and Jen So she's kind of helped out a little bit with this one, but we have got the silver arowana It's a really wonderful guy here. Love this wonderful model so these guys are a South American freshwater bony fish and their name means bone tongued or and their scientific name in terms of their genus name and their species name by Kirim, means uh, two barbules. So in terms of their native habitat they're typically found in the Amazon, the Esquindo, the Opoc basins. They're also ever from the Rio Negro basin uh, which is except for the Baraco uh, River which is also housed also inhabits both silver and black arowana, so you can find both. And they typically live in both black and white water habitats, and that includes flo uh, flooded forests. And they're relatively large, they also have these quite large scales with a tapered body. Really, really beautiful, I, th I think. And uh, their maximum length is typically about 0 0.9 meters or 3 feet. But they have been reported to get almost 4 feet or 1.2 meters. And unlike the black arowana, they have the same coloring throughout its lifespan. And they're actually very hard to tell apart as adults sometimes. And they're often called arowana in general, that includes black arowana and Asian arowana. They're often called dragonfish by aquarists because they have these shiny scales that kind of look like dragon scales. So that's where they get their name, the dragonfish. And they're also called water monkeys because they have the ability to jump out of water to catch prey. So they'll swim near the water surface and then they'll jump out to catch prey. And Specimens have been found with the remains of birds, bats, mice, and snakes, and their stomachs. So this is a big thing with um, aquaria, so you need to make sure you have a lid, because very often you can get one of these beautiful fish, and they cost like $1,000 or more, and they jump out of the tank and die, because obviously they, they like to jump, which obviously sucks, but it's something to be aware of. Um, their diet uh, also consists of crustaceans, insects, smaller fish, and other animals that float near the water surface what they use this specially adapted drawbridge like mouth to feed on that and in terms of the conservation status they're not really evaluated but there is believed to be some issues they're quite po popular ornamental fish from south america so over collecting can be an issue but there hasn't been anyone really to look into that but they seem to be doing okay i haven't heard any any dramas about that but um they're also considered pretty much a substitute for the Asian uh, arowana, which is much more expensive. But yeah, really, really cool fish, but they require big tanks and all that. But really, really wonderful. But yeah, good job to you, Buff Su, Jen, and Leaf. Really did a wonderful job with the silver arowana. Now we're going to be having a look at the uh, lake sturgeon, also known as the rock sturgeon. So another cool big fish here. How can you not love a sturgeon? So this is the rock sturgeon. They're a North American temperate freshwater fish. And they're a 
bottom feeder with a partly cartilaginous skeleton, so part of their uh, body is cartilage rather than full-on uh, bone. And they have these really cool uh, rows of bony plates along their side and back that makes them look really distinctive. They also have four distinctive uh, organs like this down their mouth, they're called barbules, which they use to uh, locate uh, fish and uh, worms and stuff in the so, uh, not the soil, it'd be like the substrate of the bottom of lakes and things. They are bottom feeders. And they can also get pretty big. They generally get uh, about 7.25 feet or 2 meters long and can weigh over 240 pounds or 108 kilograms. It's quite a big fish. They also have taste buds on these barbules that I mentioned here. They are able to use that to uh, uh, taste around and see if you find something yummy to eat. Typically, this species occurs in the Mississippi River. It also occurs in the Great Lakes and reaches Lake Winnipeg. So they're quite widespread and they're considered least concerned, so that's good. But those have very long lifespans. Ooh, look at you, what have you done? Um, males will typically live for 55 years and females can actually live between 80 to 150 years. And they grow quickly during this uh, juvenile stage, which is quite long, but then they kind of grow, grow up. Uh, slower as they get there, they're more closer to the adult size. So their lake sturgeons, uh, the eggs are mature, they become all green, grey or black, and typically they will hatch after 8 to 14 days after being uh, fertilized. And these little larvae are really, really small and they become pelagic, so they remain on the surface and uh, feed on pretty much trying to hide in the darkness from predators. But they uh, try to find rocky places and things like that and try to be attracted to the dark and then let them come out at night. And after two weeks of hatching, they will disperse downstream and with the current for several miles to reach down the river bottom. And then as juveniles, uh, all different adult structures except the gonads fall, where they will feed on bethnic invertebrates like the adults. And throughout the summer, yearlings will gather in large schools and shallow mouth bays and, and hang out with each other. And in terms of the sexual maturity, they actually will reach sexual maturity between 8 and 12 years old, but it may actually take up to 22 years for males, while females will actually um, reach sexual maturity between 14 and 33, which is pretty wild for a fish. And they typically spawn from uh, April to June, where they'll spawn in clean uh, gravel shoals and stream rapids. And they typically, uh, males are spawned every two to seven years, while females are spawned every four to nine years. And only 10 to 20% of adult sturgeon populations breed during a season. And they also are polygamous, so they have maximized that genetic diversity. So that's another big issue for them, uh, since they're not, they're very slow breeders, that can very much lead to overfishing, so that's another big issue. But luckily there have been lots of uh, restoration projects by both native, uh, peoples of America, but also people just really concerned fishermen. They've been fertilizing, uh, there's been issues such as fertilizing and overfishing and things like that. But luckily there has been some restorations in that and now they can at least concern where they've been releasing eggs from hatcheries into the wild and really working on these populations. And since obviously people uh, fish them recreationally, there are quotas and you've got to make sure you don't fish too much of them because they are really wonderful animals and we don't want to lose them. But luckily they're doing okay at the moment. So this one was also done by Leaf and uh, Buff Sue. So really wonderful animals. Let me just quickly close uh, my windows. I feel like something's going to happen. So let me just quickly do that. Oh. Can you look at that wonderful fish there? Yeah, really wonderful fish. Okay, I'm back. Back, back, back. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our next animal. Another one done by Leaf and Buff Sue. I swear you've almost annoyed to hear that at the moment. But still a really wonderful mod. We have got the Pelagic Thresher shark. So a really, really cool shark we'll have a look at here. Had to bring this guy in because he's the biggest and baddest of one of the all the fish that we got today. So this is the Pelagic Thresher shark. So these guys are a species of thresher shark that are very, very famous for these uh, extended upper lobes of their cold dolphin, which they use for all sorts of different reasons. And their 
really typically found in the subtropical and tropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, uh, typically far from shore, but they typically live in open habitats, hence the name pelagic. And they're often confused uh, by the common thresher, but they can be distinguished by their dark color and um, they're the smallest of the three species of thresher shark. These guys get up to about three meters or 10 feet long. Their diet typically involves uh, mainly small midwater fish and they stun them with their whip-like tails, which is pretty interesting. And like other uh, mackerel sharks, they, are uh, they have oviviparity, which means they give birth to litters, and typically it's about litters of two. And the babies inside the mother's womb will eat the unfertilized eggs produced by the mother. And the young are born usually large, about 43% the length of the mother. And they're often valued by commercial fisheries because of their meat, skin, uh, fins, things like that, and also uh, pursued by sport fishers. And um, they're considered endangered, so that's another bad thing. And um, uh, due to confusion with the common thresher, it's very hard to figure out where exactly their range is, but they're typically found from the Indo-Pacific, so they can be found in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, Northwestern Australia, South Africa, Red Sea, a lot of these... Um, Kind of areas and being the smallest of the uh, thresher sharks they typically get about three meters and 69.5 kilograms or 153 pounds and they weigh uh, usually they don't really exceed any more than 3.3 meters or 10 feet uh, 8 inches or 88.4 kilograms or 194 pounds with some big ones uh, maximum length is like 11.5 feet and 12 feet uh, though there is other dubious reports of larger larger ones yeah, really, really cool fish. I do say so myself. In terms of their biology and ecology, they're a very active, strong swimmer. And they're also known to be preyed upon by tooth whales and uh, sharks, other bigger sharks. And they're also been known paras uh, parasites of the species, include like certain species of tapeworms and things like that. And little information is actually known about their feeding ecology, but they know they feed on light fish uh, in the mesopelagic zone. They've also been... Uh, while these guys feed on, feed on smaller prey, they avoid competition with uh, common threshers and other larger sharks by eating smaller things such as barracudas and escolas and lightfish. Uh, while other, like, uh, so there's little competition between these guys. And in terms of life history, as I mentioned, they're oviviparous and they give birth to about two pups at a time. Uh, with no defined breeding season, so most adult females get pregnant throughout the year with an unknown gestation period, so it's believed to be less than one year. Um, and when they're born, as a, uh, the growth of these guys is about uh, 9 centimeters a year from ages 0 to 1, 8 centimeters a year from 2 to 3, 6 centimeters a year to 5 to 4, and as a kind of 2 centimeters for ages 13. And females will reach maturity at about uh, 2.8 to 2.9 meters long, uh, 2.9 meters long, so 9 feet to 9 feet 2 to 9 feet 5, while males are a little bit bigger from 8 feet 9 to 9 foot 2 or 2.7 2.8 meters. So at about 7 8 years old, while the females will get mature at about 8 to 9 years old. And the oldest confirmed sharks for about 16 to 14 years for females and males, but there is believed to be some that could be potentially living like 28 years for females and 17 for females. And a single female produces over 40 pups in her life, so she gets pretty busy. So also it's believed that the uh, these guys are really unlikely warm-blooded like common threshers, common threshers. So they lack kind of the same systems that the common thresher has. So these guys are probably more restricted to subtropical and tropical waters. And yeah, um, they're often, they've never been attacked. They never really attack humans, but they're often hunted because shark fin soup and other shark things. Uh, but they're also caught for fisheries because people think of them as game fish. But they are really beautiful, I think, at least. So, um, hopefully there's not too much of that. They are considered endangered, so don't hunt them too much. Really wonderful animals. And look at this cute little baby here. Very, very cute. Oh, that's an adult. There's a baby here. But there he is. Look at this little cutie. Anyway, we're going to move on to... Uh, we're off from fish, now we're into mammals. So we've got two uh, ungulates today. This one was just done by Leaf. Uh, this is the European Mouflon. Uh, which is often considered a feral subspecies of the domestic sheep and um, the kind of ancestral to the modern domestic sheep and uh, these guys typically reach a body length of about 120 centimeters 
and a shoulder length of 90 centimeters and a weight between 25 and 40 kilograms for use and 35 to 55 kilograms for rams as you can see they have this smooth hairy uh, coat with uh, red brown and white bits on it and they have these the rams have these very large horns that can get up to about 80 centimeters long with females having no horns in some areas but some areas they will have smaller horns so yeah really impressive male here so similar to other types of goats they usually live above the tree line and open terrain with things like binocular vision and they also have pretty good hearing and all that and really good at um, surviving and they have a very interesting vocal repertoire so similar to sheep style like uh, bleats and uh, um, all that and they'll also emit a hiss from their nostrils as kind of like a warning call or when they're alarmed and they will stomp their feet when they feel uh, as a threat and in terms of their range they're typically found in open mountainous areas with dry soils, such as today in Central Europe. They kind of live in mixed and just, uh, deciduous forests uh, up in the Central Highlands of Germany. But they are found in other areas as well. And in terms of predators, they've been known to have been preyed upon by wolves, also lynx, which have been introduced to some areas. Uh, but generally they don't have too many predators now because there's not many predators left in Europe. But we'll have a look at these other females as well. Really, really wonderful move along. In terms of behavior, they typically form s uh, small herds with the older ewe is uh, the leader. The rams will often live in separate groups until uh, outside of the rutting season. Then the males will come in the rutting season to try and take a group and make it his. Uh, pretty much with the rutting season typically being between October and November. With a gestation period of about five months with birthings taking place in March and April with uh, one or two lambs born from the mother and the suckling or oh, the time until they're weaned is about uh, six months so in terms of their history it's un uh, unclear when whether they became uh, largely extinct from europe as results of um, habitat loss or over hunting between three or four thousand years ago but only survive in the corsia and sardina uh, which because because they were only really introduced into the those islands and like the prehistoric times but luckily they survived there and a lot of people have been introducing them back into Europe from these populations so uh, they were introduced there also at the beginning of the 20th century and over the last 200 years they've been kept in various places uh, there was big declines of population during the First World War with the German Reich alone having about only 2,500 as they counted them and the lowest point I believe was like 10,000 but um, they are actually endangered and they are being managed and so it seems their population has uh, stabilized in some places their hunting has been prohibited but there are places that kind of allow you to hunt them though they have uh, relatively no numbers in some places today the largest numbers typically live in germany hungary austria and the czech republic and the introduced population of central europe is estimated to be about 60,000. in 2005 there was 90,000 with the largest population in the Czech Republic about 17,500 uh, and about 15,600 in Germany from 2010. So there has been some slight declines, but they're typically doing okay. And uh, these guys kind of are a money spot because they're really considered native and stuff. The ICN typically considers them as a feral population of ancient domestic livestock and they therefore don't really provide a assessment because they think of it as a subspecies, but they are pretty good. But yeah, they are considered, uh, are they allowed to hunt them, but they have to be given rights by the Federal Hunting Act, and there's a bag limit and all that. But yeah, they're doing okay, so if you want to hunt one, you have to go to Germany and make sure you don't exceed your bag limit. But really, really wonderful animals, nice to see these move ones doing okay. And this one was just done by Leaf. Leaf did a really wonderful job with these guys. And last, and most definitely not least, we've got a mod from Narwhaler. We have got an extinct animal, we have got the Quagga. So this is the Equus Quagga Quagga. So let's have a look at these guys. So we've probably covered these guys before, but let's go over that again. So these guys are a subspecies of the plain sleeper, actually the dominant subspecies technically. And they were endemic to South Africa until the they were hunted to extinction in the late 19th century due to um, settlers and colonists. Um, they're also long thought to be a distant species, but genetic studies have supported them as a subspecies of uh, plain zebra. And even more recent studies suggest that they were more like a southernmost ecotype or plain of um, zebra, or plain zebra. 
So in terms of their size, they're believed to be about 257 centimeters, 8 feet 5 inches long, and 125 to 135 uh, centimeters, or 4 foot 1 to 4 foot 5 tall at the shoulder. With these uh, really interesting stripes, they don't have the typical black or white stripes of other uh, zebras. They kind of have these primarily brown and white stripes, and they appear a little bit more horse-like. Though there's uh, also the distribution of the stripes kind of varied a lot throughout the body with a lot more on their head and kind of turning more white and stuff like that. There's a lot of variation within that. And there's not too much known about their behavior, but it's believed that they lived in herds of about 30 to 50. And it's said they were uh, wild and lively, but actually more docile than the related Richelle zebra. And they were once found in great numbers in the Karoo of Cape Province and the Orange Free State of South Africa. So they're quite common around that time. But um, after European settlement of South Africa, the, they were extensively hunted and it's competed with domestic animals for food. And there were some taken to zoos, but breeding programs were unsuccessful. And the last wild one, uh, wild population lived in the Orange Free State and was considered extinct in the wild by 1878. The last captive specimen dying in Amsterdam on the 12th of August, 1883. The only one quagga has ever been photographed alive. And it was actually the first animal whose DNA was analyzed. And we'll get to this soon, but there's actually a project to try and bring them back, quote unquote. So, as I mentioned, they have a very interesting taxonomic history. They're thought to be a species, but they were kind of lumped into the plain species or Equus quagga, um, and then became the nominant subspecies. Uh, but now they're kind of almost considered like a Klein because of being from South Africa, which is the most kind of Mediterranean or the least uh kind of the most what would you say the mediterranean climate around south africa which also like affected animals like the blue buck which also went extinct so these guys had this like habitat where a lot of settlers came and kind of wiped them out that really um, restricted habitat but um in terms of their uh evolution uh it was confirmed the quagga is more closely related to zebras and it shows this roughly two parts per million uh years uh, in the divergence from other species and it seems that these guys are related to uh, the Equus quagga quagga so they are that kind of species um, and it shows that the plain zebra populations confirmed the quagga as a member of the species and they found really not much evidence between a uh, space of morphological differences between the northern and southern populations of zebras which included the quagga so these guys are almost now considered more of a uh, like a morph you could say they're kind of a color because if you could see there's the studies that talk about this is that there's a lot of variation because these guys live all across africa especially plain zebra they're the most more common species so species that live in more warm areas they kind of have that more typical black and white striping to defend themselves from bugs but as you get more south and everything gets a bit cooler these guys kind of get these more brownish colors and it's kind of you can see it there's some pretty good pictures on the internet illustrating this but these guys are believed to be like the southernmost extreme of this climb so that's also pretty interesting and um yeah in terms of relationship with humans we obviously killed them to extinction and it's also believed that um hybrids there were also hybrids from um horses came from these guys uh but typically they just kind of didn't do well they were hunted because they competed with domestic livestock and they also were highly strong so they're not really good for domestication but really really cool animals uh, sadly that they're gone and were hunted to extinction by people and they were considered so beautiful so capable of domestication but they were wiped off the earth and it's been considered a disgrace and i definitely agree but because there's such close relationship with the plain zebra and the quagga there has been the quagga project which started in 1987 in south africa where they tried to create a quagga like zebra by selectively breeding uh or for reduced stripe patterns within the stocks of uh, plain zebra that lived there and to differentiate differentiate between the real quaggas and the zebras for this project they called the raul quaggas because the guy raul started the project and the family population is considered to be about 19 individuals and they have been breeding them since to try and create that uh, more color like this compared to uh, your normal plain zebra. But these guys have been part of uh, restoration programs where they've been trying to reintroduce animals such as wildebeest, ostriches, which were there 
uh, during historical times in the southern parts of South Africa, but obviously wiped out by people. But they're thinking about breeding back and also reintroducing wildebeest and ostriches and things like that into these populations. And as of 2006, there's about third or fourth generation uh, animals being produced. And they l actually look pretty much like a quagga, which is very interesting. Though the practice itself is pretty controversial, it's called breeding back. These guys really only resemble quaggas in their outward appearance, they don't have the same genetics as the quagga. Though there have been people talking about using de-extinction, quote-unquote, where they could potentially uh, take DNA and put them in the egg of a plain zebra, so a mother plain zebra would be able to produce a quagga through cloning. But obviously that's technology's kind of a bit far out of reach now, probably a couple decades before that happens. But still a really, really cool animal, and I think uh, really deserving. Narwhala, you did a wonderful job. So yeah, I think this will be a very great place to end the episode after talking about the wonderful quagga. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye